Greetings and salutations, loyal viewers of this channel. My name is Sean, and today I have returned from Tim Pool's compound, where I am told by very many people on the progressive left, about 800,000 people live there, but I can confirm it's actually 2.6 million. That is right, Tim has a compound with 265 million people there, and they all live there in his skate park, and Emma Vigland, as she said on the internet.com, was not allowed to see it because she was going to expose the half a billion people that live at Tim Pool's compound. Now, before we get into this, before we get into my appearance on the Culture War episode, which was pretty fun, although weird, because ultimately I ended up becoming a moderator, I just want to say thank you to everybody who signed up over my website, actualjusticewarrior.com slash join. Oh, give me the money. Give you give me the money. Okay. And thank you to my listeners on Spotify, on Apple's podcasting platform, and on Google's podcasting platform. So the number one criticism, the number one critique that I received based on my appearance on this Culture War episode was the fact that I did not talk nearly enough to the satisfaction of you guys out there in the audience. And one of the reasons why this happened was because Emma kept trying to redirect every time I countered her point because she had no counter to any point that I made, which I will put forward forward repeatedly throughout the course of this video with examples. Eventually, she was able to redirect to Medicare for All as a solution for crime, but considering the topic was the year-over-year -year increase from 2019 to 2020 and how it's been elevated ever since then, not just in the city of New York, but nationwide, although we didn't get to the overall nationwide numbers, it would seem weird that Medicare for All would be proposed as a solution to reduce crime back to where it was in 2019 because obviously the spike was not caused by a removal of Medicare for All. In reality, in actuality, we passed a series of stupid criminal justice reforms nationwide at the federal level, the First Step Act, and at the state level, at the local level, multiple different pieces of legislation, people cut their police funding, and all of those things led to varying degrees of crime spikes nationwide that led to an overall crime spike. And one of the things that I brought up in this in particular was the year-over-year -year increase in homicides. I believe I said in 20. 2021, but it's actually the 2020 year over year increase in the city of New York of about 47%. Crime and, is down in New York City in and, 2023 and, and, in, and by every down, metric. Down compared to what? Down compared to 2021 and but was, 2022. Don't change, don't change it, the subject, no, no, right? You, you accused not. us no, no, of publishing minute, videos we don't publish. If it's down in 20 compared to 2021 <laughs> and there was a giant year over year increase from 2020 to 2021, then you're talking about something that's down. It wasn't down. giant. It was a small bump from the a pandemic. A 47% increase in homicide in the city of New York is not a small bump. It was now, of course, Emma Viglund was not prepared for this argument. In fact, she did this trick where she said, according to the current 2023 numbers, crime is actually down in the city of New York. Now, first and foremost, we're in the year 2023. So these are the non-conclusive numbers which come out at the end of the year. Secondly, New York's population has actually declined 400,000 since 2020. So even a down year in terms of raw numbers doesn't necessarily mean that something is down per capita. And finally, as I said on the show, and you guys heard me say it, that after a giant increase, a slight decrease still elevates crime overall as compared to 2019. Homicides are have been on a precipitous decline since the 70s, since the 80s, okay. since the 90s. There was a bump because of desperation in the pandemic, There's... and now it's back down in 2023. So, like... That's irrefutable. That's the NYPD's own data. That's on all major crimes, murders, rapes, grand larcenies, so this uh, robberies. Is a... <clears throat> this is an argument I'm often confronted with, and it's actually pretty terrible. So crime is down from the peak for sure, right? In some years in New York City, we had 2,100 murders. I think that's the largest ever in the history of the city of New York. However, my standard isn't, it's not as bad as the worst time in the history of the city of New York. When I mm -hmm. see murders jump year over year from about 319 to 469. What do you mean year over year? The two years that I just Year listed? over year, as in from 2020 to 2021. That would be a year yes, over year yes. increase. That is a dramatic increase. And it's the largest since, I believe, 2010. The greatest year over year increase of all time in the city of New York, by the way. But it's all but the it's way back to 2010 again. numbers. It's down. Yeah, again. it's down is, compared to the increase, but it's not down compared to 
2019. Was- now, of course, Emma Vigeland had no real response to this. In fact, what she ended up bringing up was the response that I'm often used to hearing when it comes to crime, crime in New York City, crime nationwide, which is the idea that crime isn't as bad as the 1990s. Now, for some reason, she said crime has been declining since the 70s. That's when crime was really spiking up. It's actually been declining since the 90s, although they kept putting the murder rate chart on the screen during the show for the city of New York and then for the nation as a whole, but it is since the 1990s. And as I said on the show, which is something I've said multiple different times on this channel, my standard isn't if crime is declined as compared to its peak, as compared to the worst time in American history. The fact of the matter is, again, as laid out in the clips that I played throughout the course of this video, New York was in and around 300 murders a year, and year over year, they jumped to 450. So the fact that in 1990, in one of the worst years in the history of New York, we had over 2,100 homicides does not provide me any comfort when obviously we've set ourselves back to 2010 numbers where we're in and around 450 460 homicides so we're trending in the wrong direction after years of a precipitous decline this is what i was concerned about and this is what emma was totally in denial over poverty um, leads to crime this i is, would imagine this is that. Inaccurate. why do you think uh 25 people got shoved in front of trains last year i don't know dude well i that's a legitimate question you're saying that uh, <laughs> you're saying poverty and desperation results in crime I'm wondering why it is that you've had these uh, uh, these homeless guys that have been predominant. I think it's almost entirely these homeless guys. Now, by the way, while I had an absolutely wonderful time hanging out with Tim Post this, I ended up doing a show with Seamus, the Freedom Tunes guy, which I will link out for the future when that gets uploaded. And I appeared on TimCast IRL. I will say Tim did not help me in this regard because he was basically going down the rabbit holes with Emma going forward from this point on. Because what I was attempting to do before I was interrupted a few times during this segment was try to get Emma to say if it's not as bad as the absolute peak then we shouldn't worry about it at which time I would have pivoted to the city of Philadelphia because unlike New York City which is just experiencing a dramatic increase in homicides Philadelphia is actually the worst it's ever been in the history of the city of Philadelphia in terms of murders and I could go to example after example like this where crime is not only worse than the 1990s but it's the worst that it's ever been in any given given particular city and or area. I would have loved to press on that. However, Tim ended up helping pivot to another topic because Emma was throwing out, you know, nonsense about Medicare for all and all this jazz. And I ended up hitting her later when it came to the issue of poverty driving crime or crime driving poverty, which of course we've explained over and over again on this channel how in fact crime actually drives poverty. So when you're talking about poverty leading to crime, like what is that based on? Because after prohibition was repealed All of human history. during the Great Depression, crime fell. During the Great Recession, people with your line of thinking thought we would see a crime spike nationwide. It didn't happen. You can actually look at the crime wave if you wanted to pull it up. That didn't occur. And that was the largest recession in the history of this country since the Great Depression. So what we've seen throughout American history is poverty not leading to crime. What we actually see is the opposite, that crime drives areas into poverty. We look at store closures across the country due to the fact that we have shoplifting. That leads to decaying in the neighborhoods. When people <laughs> abandon the neighborhoods and you see this blight, that has a psychological impact on people and that drives people to commit these crimes. I mean, you're working backwards from the- No, you're mass- actually working backwards. Wait, 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 but no- so this is one of my favorite segments right there because Emma lays out the premise that crime is driven by poverty and that desperation is what creates criminality. Again, if it weren't for the fact that there was a third person in there, I would have asked her if she believes that rape is driven by desperation and poverty. If people can commit that crime in particular because they don't have enough money in their bank account because that crime goes along with murders, assaults, and all these other crimes. However, I was able to point out that if you actually look at a chart, and it's this chart in particular, of the homicide rate in the United States of America, you can see for yourself that with the recessions included, there's actually no correlation at all whatsoever between recessions and increases in crime. In fact, the example that I gave was the Great Depression, which prohibition was repealed two years into the Great Depression. Crime actually fell after prohibition was repealed because the public policy of prohibition 
is what was causing the increase in crime. It was not the economic circumstances. And again, the Great Depression was, in fact, the Great Depression. Then you have the Great Recession. And there's all these articles about the crime wave that never happened during the Great Recession, as referenced in there. I wish it was pulled up on screen, but, you know, I'm not the producer on this show. I'm just sitting there making conversation. There was also no increase in crime. So Emma is putting forward this idea that we have crime driven by poverty, yet we have examples of such sudden shocks forcing millions of people in the United States of America into poverty and crime not increasing, it in fact decreasing. Because again, crime is not driven by poverty. There are demographics within this country that commit higher rates of violent crime as middle class or upper middle class participants than other demographics that are in the lower class. There are poorer countries that commit less crime than richer countries. There are periods of time where the American population was poorer than it was now, where they had a much lower crime rate and vice versa, where they had more money or their incomes were gaining and crime was going up this does not exist this correlation is non-present no no poverty clearly this is a very simple concept leads to something like shoplifting why would someone shoplift based on a personal pathology they're shoplifting because they're desperate not necessarily like so we have a lot yeah. of lax shoplifting laws in california for example so they're and doing what they find is we have a lot of organized retail theft because there's no consequences for it that's profit for for I mean, instance, not, there people are trying to make money. Well, so, and so, they're desperate, and we have we have untold levels of income inequality in this country. Well, since is it the income late inequality or since poverty? Since the late seventies, nine hundred percent. That's the increase in CEO pay versus twelve yeah. percent for the working class in this country. That's you don't think bad. that that leads to levels of desperation? I so wait, wait, is look, income inequality the cause or is poverty the cause? Because those are two different things. I, I mean, they go hand in hand. They really don't. Yes, they do. Because all not the wealth all. is going towards the CEOs and to the billionaires in this country. But it's not and a zero sum economy. Down. But, what, 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 I, I what, what but, but also, if income inequality is the driver of crime, then how come we saw a giant crime decline after the mid 90s when income inequality was going up? In fact, we saw this happen all the way to 2019. Can you repeat that? We had a giant crime decline from around 1995, 1996 nationwide from all the way to 2019, while income inequality was rising during that period of time. Right. So why would that occur if income inequality is driving crime? I mean, I, I'm I'm not exactly sure you're the expert, but I do know that you are saying that there was an increase in crime in 2021 and 2022, well, and it doesn't matter now that it's going back this. down to 2023 levels. And one of the reasons why you know for a fact that Emma had no counter to any of the points I was making is that she pivoted right there to income inequality. And as you can see, me being the perceptive listener that I am, I ask her, what is she talking about? Is she talking about poverty, which is what she said before, or is she moving to income inequality? And then she tries to conflate the two, even though, again, overall incomes can go up. And oftentimes throughout the history of this country and everywhere in the history of the world, when income inequality is broadening, incomes overall are rising. In fact, in the United States of America, the middle class was built during the Gilded Age. This is when income inequality was exploding. And the specific example I gave to this person who said to my face that crime was driven by income inequality was the fact that from 1995 to 2019, income inequality rose dramatically in the United States of America, while at the same time, we saw the greatest decline in crime each and every single year over the same period. So if income inequality, increasing income inequality, caused crime, then we would see an increase in crime during that period, not a decrease in crime. There was also the point where I unfortunately again did get cut off by Tim Pool, where I said that we had all this social spending, all this welfare spending, the war on poverty in the 1960s. And if you look at the chart again that they put forward, you can actually see the crime crime wave actually increase during that same period of time. Now, unlike Emma, I actually have something that does correlate with this, which is the attitudes and policies put in place. I think public policy has a huge impact as well, because again, we saw a dramatic crime. This crime wave started in the 1960s, right? And this is when we started embracing this idea that poverty was the root cause of crime, that this was more the realm of the social workers, all things that sound really familiar to today. And from 1960 all the way to 1979, the incarceration rate, even though in raw numbers it was rising, was dropping per capita. So we saw this crime increase, and you would, what you would end up getting in 1979 for murder, on average, was something like five years. For rape, it was something like 3.4 years. And obviously, like this created a problem because we just weren't prosecuting people. This is why we ended up going with a mass incarceration solution, which, by the way, did work. 
and all these other policies <laughs> to get tough on crime. You laugh, but you're definitely no, I... as they relate to crime. So a perfect example of this was the fact that I said again on the show that from 1960 to 1979, we had a decrease in the per capita rate of incarceration. Now, our population was exploding. So technically, we had more people in terms of raw numbers going into prisons. But our net prison population, our per capita prison population was in fact decreasing. It was going down. During that period of time, you would get a little over five years on average for a murder and a little over three years on average for a rape. And this was all the way to 1979. Then this started to reverse when we had tough on crime policies and we started locking people up under the theory of incapacitation. Now, I specifically cited this Brennan Center report, which was actually put forward against me as a counter to something that I've said in the past, which was, oh, mass incarceration is ineffective because it lost its effectiveness after the year 2000. And what this means, and what I've described to you guys on this channel multiple different times, is that mass incarceration, like everything, has diminishing returns and or marginal utility, which means it's going to work up to a certain point where you can measure the gains, but after a while, doing the same exact thing will not continually resort in an increase in the results that you're looking for. A perfect example of this is the fact that if I were to say a gallon of water could save somebody's life, this would be true, provided that this person did not have a lot of water if you don't have any water and i give you a gallon of water guess what that's going to save your life right but up until a certain point that is not going to be as effective. For instance, if you have so much water that you have an Olympic-sized swimming pool in your backyard, me giving you a gallon of water is not going to do anything for you. That doesn't mean it's untrue that a gallon of water can save somebody's life. That means that it's true, but there's marginal utility. It's only true up to a certain point, and after that point, you're going to have enough that the value of that individual gallon to your life and to your health is not going to be that high. Again, Pretty simple concept. I've explained it a bunch of different times. Here's the chart on mass incarceration. And as you can see, the bulk of the incarceration was in the 80s and 90s and saying it's less effective after the year 2000. This is because we locked up the people who were offending consistently and that significantly already drove down the crime rate. And it worked is because the philosophy behind mass incarceration is pretty simple. What you're trying to do is incapacitate criminals because the same criminals are often reoffending. You brought up shoplifting earlier. You can actually pull up an article to find out that the same 300 people in New York City represent a third of the shoplifting arrests total for a single okay, year. So we should have a system of mass incarceration because there are 300. I didn't say that. Because I, I'm talking to you now. There are 300 repeat offenders. No, no. We should incapacitate re repeat offenders so they stop offending. Got so it. If so this you're is arrested, all about the fact that you're, you're arrested not in favor of bail reform because we, in, in New York State, which is now currently being rolled back, in uh, we decided that we weren't going to require cash bail for nonviolent felonies and for misdemeanors. And you think that that's a good policy? To not require cash bail? Yeah. Uh, no, I, mean, I think, or that, I think or that, that that we're rolling it back. I think I think, I think look, if if you're concerned about people not being able to get out of jail because of their financial means, then I can understand reducing or even eliminating the cash bail system. Because I understand if you don't have a lot of money, even though you really only have to throw down 10% for bail in most cases, unless it's a, you know, like a set figure for the bond, then I get that argument. But what you need, and the state of New York desperately needs this, is some kind of threat assessment. Like you should be able to hold somebody if they present themselves as a danger or a repeat offender, regardless of bail, without bail, so that they don't continue to reoffend. Okay, but do you know what happens when people are held in Rikers, for example, as in a pre-detention center? How many deaths have happened there before they're even committed of a, or convicted of a crime? Look, now, this led to a pivot about the specific conditions of Rikers Island and Emma saying, oh, this many people died in Rikers Island. I mean, people die in places all the time, and it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is the fact that in the state of New York, judges cannot assess dangerousness. This creates a problem. I don't need them to throw up a bail amount that's big number that's going to keep people in prison or in jail actually if they can't afford it but i want them to have judgment if people have prior convictions repeat offenses all of those things which are red flags which should get you held in jail and emma does not seem to understand this concept there again that's an issue for how the jailing system works in new york city and I am in favor of building out the jail capacity because you're talking we're... about cash bail, though. That is exactly uh, that is exactly yes. the point that we're discussing here. Yeah. Right. So you're in favor of people being held before they're convicted of a crime. Yes. In Rikers. 
if they if they show a propensity to reoffend, a hundred percent. What is a propensity to reoffend? Um, a history like being arrested over and over again, prior convictions. Yes. So you think that they should be held in a prison that has been? It's a jail, but yes. Uh, yeah, or jail. Excuse me, a jail that has been proven to be one of the worst conditions in the country. Well, it doesn't have to Suicides, be specifically Rikers dozens Island. Dozens of deaths just this year, even if they haven't been committed of a crime. Convicted of convicted a crime. Convicted of a crime. Uh, yeah, for sure. But I think. But I th that's very anti constitutional and anti How is it anti constitutional? Um, the Fourth Amendment. It violates the Fourth Amendment. Protects you from illegal search and seizures. Well, I mean, you are the, the right to a speedy fifth? trial. People are held. I do I'm think sorry, Fifth Amendment. Yes, I do think we should I, I have could, reform could, yeah, on the joke. on the speedy trial side. But the idea that it's unconstitutional to hold somebody pre-trial is ridiculous. Our law is based on English common six. law. Six. Damn. Uh, six. Yeah, there. We're all. Bad. Our law is yeah. based on English common law, and the reason we have jails is that you would actually be held in a dungeon awaiting trial. So it's like built into the system. Bail is like a courtesy. It's actually a progressive reform in response to that, where you lay down some kind of capital in place of yourself. How so much the idea money do you want to spend on jails in New York City? As much as it takes. You know, I have to say, sometimes I watch myself on these things and I realize that I may not be the nicest person in the world because she's asking me these dumb, basic questions and I'm answering them so directly because I basically can predict them before they come out of her face. And it ultimately ends up making her look absolutely ridiculous because I'm saying the most basic things that you could possibly say. Like, judges should have judgments. If you have a propensity to offend, you should not be released out onto the streets to offend again. So, just warehousing people before they're convicted of anything. Well, it, again, it's not warehousing everybody, but if you have a propensity to reoffend, I think judges should be able to have judgment. It's kind of in the name. And assess these people and hold them. So, you just want to give it to the judgment of the judges. And it doesn't... Yes, I would like the judges to have judgment, yes. Okay, but there should be guardrails in place to prevent judges from... I mean, judges are human beings. They can be unjust as well. I don't really put them well, on you the could, you could have, obvi you Obviously, I'm not in favor of like a million-dollar bond for somebody who's arrested for shoplifting, even if they're arrested 27 times. So, yeah, you can have guardrails from the legislature, but... They can't assess dangerousness right now in the state of New York. Well, Emma, like a child, like a little baby, like somebody who has no experience, no concept of the world, is saying, oh, well, what does uh, that mean? And uh, should we just hold people pre-trial? And you just hear me confidently say, yes, 100%. We should definitely do that. And then she makes the point that it's anti-constitutional. And then she searches for a right to a speedy trial. Now, again, if you watch my channel, you know I've addressed all of these arguments before multiple multiple different times. They're not good arguments. And I said it right there. If there's an issue with Rikers Island in particular, which by the way, she calls it the most dangerous. I think what she's actually saying is that because it's the largest jail, you end up with more deaths at Rikers Island. And by the way, she was mentioning deaths, not murders, not deaths due to neglect or anything like that. Prison populations or jail populations tend to be unhealthy. They tend to have a bunch of problems. And guess what? They commit violence against one another. Now, Rikers Island happens to be managed by the city of New York. And compared to the jails that are managed by local sheriff's departments with nowhere near the funding, it's actually probably one of the better jail facilities in the country, not one of the worst. But again, she's going with raw numbers of deaths as her measurement, even though Rikers Island serves a giant population that is larger than than any other jails based population again usually jails are held at the county level by the sheriffs and sheriffs do not cover anywhere near as ground as new york city so you have the largest potential criminal population going into rikers island you should not be surprised that you have a higher number or a raw number that's kind of high or sounds high in terms of deaths but again that has nothing to do with anything what i'm talking about is incapacitating repeat offenders if there's a problem at rikers you fix the problem at rikers which is why I dismissed her nonsense about problems at Rikers. Then she moves on to say it's unconstitutional. Unconstitutional to hold people awaiting trial, which is just not true. One of the reasons why you have a right to a speedy trial, which is something that she mentioned in her thing where she was trying to go through the amendments, is because prior to the installment of the Sixth Amendment, it was just assumed, expected, that you would be held in jail awaiting trial. And in fact, bail is a progressive reform. Now, this is based on English common law, based on the idea that you would essentially be held in a dungeon, which is a jail cell, awaiting the king's judgment. Now, the reason you have a right to a speedy trial is because they don't want you to be held for so long awaiting trial. This is one of the reasons why I fully support 
reforms speeding up the criminal justice process because I don't want these people being held in perpetuity awaiting trial. But again, this is not an argument against judges being able to assess dangerousness. This is an argument about actually putting more money into getting these people to trial faster so that way we can decide who's guilty, who's innocent, and all that through the process. So again, another terrible argument. And then she goes with the judges be racist argument. They assess it in ways, the reason we put this law into place, which is now being rolled back, that were deemed inherently racist. They How deem so? that, th that it was uh, disproportionately black and brown people who are okay, warehouse Okay, but how's writers. that racist though? Because at their discretion, it was put into, it was implemented in a racist way. It's but if the you same look at the crime statistics, they're well, disproportionately there you go. So that, so, so black you're, and Hispanic. So this is what the reality is for you, is you believe that black and Hispanic people inherently are committing When did I say inherently? Crimes. I mean, th this if is- If you pull up like NYPD crime data, for instance, since you brought up stop and frisk, you can look at the shootings, like the shooting suspects in any given year. And if you find me a year where 92% or greater is not black or hispanic in terms of the shooting suspects then then i mean i would be shocked because i've looked at it oh, for the, the past suspects. 20 years so yes yeah, suspects the cops discretion so no you... no it's you get a report right and you get a description of the suspect and they are 92 percent every single year or above black or hispanic now she just asserts randomly that the state legislature passed this law because it was proven that judges were in fact racist and when i asked her what she means unsurprisingly she of course says oh well disproportionately black and hispanic people are being held and assessed as dangerous but the thing is they're disproportionately committing crimes. And the example that I use, because we're talking about New York, is the NYPD's crime data on shootings in particular. And by the way, this was a reflection back on stop and frisk and stop, question, and frisk, which, of course, was targeting shootings. They would send the police to areas with high rates of shootings to stop, question, and frisk suspects in the search for illegal guns. And if you look at the charts right here, you can go to any given year. I've done this. I will link this in the description. You will not find a single year where the shooting suspects comprise less than 92%, and in reality, probably less than 93%, black and Hispanic people. Now, if the program is meant to target shootings, it's meant to target illegal guns, and you're sending cops via the CompSat system, which is just a map of crime geographically, to the areas where shootings are occurring, according to reports, and those areas happen to be largely black and Hispanic, why would we be surprised that black and Hispanic people are stopped disproportionate to their population, and by the way, not disproportionate to their level of crime? In fact, if anything is disproportionate, it's the fact that they were under-targeted by stop, question, and frisk, because stop, question, and frisk, again, 93% of the crime that they were targeting, which was shootings, ended up being black or Hispanic, but at peak, they only stopped 86%. Then we also have this ridiculous denial of the goal of the program, which Emma Viglin asserts was not about deterring the carrying of firearms. She says, no, 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 it was about finding whatever, and the hit rate wasn't low enough, which of course I mocked by saying, this is like saying, because you've decided it should do this, therefore it's ineffective. It's like saying a plane is ineffective because it doesn't work well as a submarine, even though it's not designed to do that. And we have this little back and forth I'm, I'm but, not going to say but that. The I just want to cut you off because you mentioned Bloomberg and I want to respond to what you said. Under Bloomberg, 90% of the stop and frisks that were done were, by the way, they didn't find anything, but 90% targeted black and brown people. So it's, you're taking- So the, the you're highest taking, number, no, by no, the way, no, no, is 86%, no, no, no. not 90%, taking, but go ahead. You're taking the data, you're taking the data and using what the cops did where they over police in certain areas and then pretending like there's an overrepresentation inherently criminally in those current kinds of populations and it's it's okay. a racist argument so you're wrong in a bunch of different ways so let me just like run through them so first and foremost the highest year was 86 percent, and that was the year with the dramatic increase in stops and if you ask me if i'm in favor of just expanding stop and frisk which is different from giuliani's stop question and frisk although you know you might not be interested in that specific difference to the levels that bloomberg did i would say it's unnecessary it aggravates people it creates a whole bunch of problems that being said they're not over targeted because again there is no year during the entire tenure of bloomberg where the shooting suspects were any less than 92 percent so what the nypd does because it's the most data-driven police force in the entire world is they map crime through a system called comstat when there's a lot of shootings in a specific area they send the police to those areas the 
stops, questions, and frisks all relate to where the shootings are. And it just so happens to be those areas are black or Hispanic. Right. But, and but, by the but num- do you get accosted on the street by cops regularly in New York City? I, it happened to me when I was younger. Yes. But like not. OK. Now. But do you understand? But, but how to your point about hit rate, how- because you brought it up. Hit rate was not the goal of stop, question, and frisk. Like, this is one of the things where you're like, oh, well, this program didn't work because my standard that I look for arbitrarily shows that it was ineffective. That's like saying a plane doesn't work because it's not a good submarine. No, it's like, not that doesn't arbitrary. make any 90% sense. 90% of the stop and frisk came up with nothing. True, but the point was to so deter say, the say carrying doing, of firearms. Say, have you done well, illegal drugs in your life? Uh, maybe. I just, I, just I have. Don't. I have. I could have been stopped and frisked. And I could have gone to prison or I could have been held if I had a little bit less money in Rikers indefinitely until my trial came because a cop just decided, hey, I'm going to stop and frisk you. But they wouldn't do that to me because I'm a white woman. Right, that's nice. Well, but me, anyway, it's just... about shooting. No, and wanna... the point of the program, no, and this is shooting. stated quite literally to deter people from carrying illegal firearms. And, 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 and absolutely and I'm gonna, not. But it's not up for debate. It's not in question. I can just play you the clip of Michael Bloomberg so he could tell you what the goal of the NYPD was himself. 95% of your murders and murderers and murder victims fit one and all. You can just take the description Xerox it and pass it out to all the cops. They are male minorities, 15 to 25. That's true in New York, it's true in virtually every city. And that's where the real crime is. You've got to get the guns out of the hands of the people that get killed. So you've got to, if you want to spend the money for a lot of cops in the street, put those cops where the crime is, which means in the minority neighborhoods. So this is one of the unintended consequences is People say, oh, my God, you are arresting kids for marijuana. They're all minorities. Yes, that's true. Why? Because we throw all the cops in the minority neighborhoods. Yes, that's true. Why do we do it? Because that's where all the crime is. And the, the way you get the guns out of the kids' hands is uh, to throw them against the wall and, and frisk them. Because, and then they start, they say, oh, I don't, want that. I don't want to get caught, so they don't bring the gun. They still have a gun, but they leave it at home. Did you hear that? Did you hear him say it loudly and clearly? This was the guy in charge of New York City. He was the mayor. He appointed the police commissioner, and he said quite clearly his goal was not necessarily to find guns. It's okay if we don't find guns because that means we leave the guns at home if we're the criminals. That's what he wants because he's trying to deter shootings. Now, what is a more accurate representation of the goals of the program? Is it Michael Bloomberg saying well before he got any of this crazy scrutiny from people on the left that the goal was to deter the carrying of firearms from criminals in the city of New York? Or is it Emma Viglin saying that because the hit rate is low, therefore the program is not effective? Obviously, one is correct, one is accurate, and that was what was presented by me. And this should be unsurprising to you because I am very aware of what the goals of the interventions that I talk about actually are. Now, Tim at one point said that this was a violation of the Second Amendment and a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And honestly, this is nonsensical, and I've talked about this multiple different times. Now, if Bloomberg when he expanded the program and he didn't look for reasonable suspicion or follow the original parameters under Giuliani, did brush up against violations of the Fourth Amendment. But remember, the goal of this was to look for illegal guns. Now, Tim asserted that there were no illegal guns. So I said, what about people with felonies? What about minors carrying guns, pistols, and all that? And he said, there's nothing in the Constitution that says you have to be of age a legal adult in order to carry a firearm. However, this is often down to the local laws. This often says that you can be barred from owning firearms if you're under the age of 18. And this is basic logic and common sense. Now, states can extend the right to carry guns to below the age of 18 if they want. This is what happened with open carry when it comes to long guns in Wisconsin, which ended up protecting Kyle Rittenhouse from being charged with possession of an illegal gun. But they can also prohibit it just like they can prohibit you from voting if you're under the age of 18, joining the military, and all of these other things because we have decided that that is the cutoff. Congress is given the right to form an army. They have historically been empowered to draft people into Congress. Combat, but if you were to try to draft somebody at age 14 to join the United States Army in order to fight a war, people would be in uproar and they would say, obviously, just because it's in the 
Constitution that the Congress can do this does not mean that they necessarily have the authority to supersede what we consider to be a minor in certain regards versus what we consider to be an adult. Obviously, the most expansive version of your rights are achieved upon adulthood, and states can make their own regulations in and around the edges of that. And again, I just fully disagree with Tim Pool's position. And there was a point where Emma asked me if I was in favor of gun control. I just want to point out that she is, in fact, in favor of gun control. So she's just against the enforcement mechanisms. And I said quite seriously that I'm not a major gun guy in the United States of America. I would like to be able to possess a firearm, but New York City makes this unbelievably difficult. So the idea that I have to go through a million different hoops in order to get a firearm in the city of New York, and by the way, some of those hoops were declared unconstitutional in the Bruin decision, which I am in support of. However, kids that have illegal guns that, by the way, are killing each other at ever-increasing rates, who are supposed to have less rights than me as an adult, are able to do that is absurd. Also, this is totally in conflict with Tim's position on whether or not minors can consent to surgeries. Like, again, do we limit the rights and the choices and the freedoms of minors or not? Do we accept that we're allowed to do that or not? And Tim seems to think that in some cases we can, some cases we can't. So this was just a dead end point at the argument. It's really dumb. And considering I was pressing Emma in this regard, this part really annoyed me. Now, that being said, Tim ended up winning me over in a lot of ways throughout the course of this conversation, especially when Emma started to get personal. Now, there's a whole bit about the song and about them distorting the audio, and Emma saying, oh, we don't have the technology to do that, which is ridiculous because, again... Audacity is free, as I mentioned in my video. Now, you can watch all of that stuff and watch Tim Pool defend himself against those various attacks, but I'm here to provide you some background, and in the background is the following. Prior to the start of recording, we actually agreed on the initial topic. It was actually the Jordan Williams case. Now, if you watch the entire stream, you'll notice we didn't talk about it. The reason why is because Emma Vigland immediately said Tim should have Sam Cedar on, he needs to have Sam Cedar on, he needs to debate Sam Cedar, because all these people are scared of Sam Cedar. And by the way, I ended up concluding the broadcast with looking directly into the camera, as I'll say it right now, and saying, I will debate Sam Cedar. I will show up in studio. They are in New York. I will go to them. It will cost them nothing. And I will debate him on all of his stupid crime denial tactics without Tim Pool present so that you can bring up quotes or whatever nonsense in order to distract when you're getting nailed down on the points. I saw Nuance for a tweet out something to the effect of Emma after trying to go up against me, decided that she was just going to go back to attacking Tim because she would rather get into a petty personal argument than an actual policy debate with me on criminal justice topics because she has nothing to say to somebody like me on criminal justice topics because I will destroy each and every one of her points. This is true. So I extend the offer to Sam Cedar. And by the way, I expect Sam Cedar to refuse this offer. And one of the reasons why is because Sam has made it clear that he only really wants to debate people not to actually have a debate not to actually have a conversation, but to win over people from larger audiences than himself. So Sam would likely view my channel as not a large enough audience in order to do so. So what I will say, because this channel is growing large in part, thanks to you guys out there in the audience, that the moment I pass Sam Cedar and subscribers and whatever metric that he's looking for, the moment that I become large enough for Sam Cedar to come and debate me and try to win over my audience on criminal justice related topics topics because that's what I primarily talk about. The invitation is still open. I will still go on his show again in person. You want to do it over video. That's fine, but I will be live streaming it from my side if it is on video because I'm not going to get cut off mid sentence without any ability to respond or all of the dirty tricks that Sam wants to put forward. But again, nobody's afraid of you, Sam. I'm certainly not afraid of you. A lot of people might think you are very intelligent because you look like a nerd, but I see right through your dumb crime denial tactics because it's the same nonsense that I've addressed a million Million times on this channel and coming from you it is not any more intimidating and as for sam cedar i'm also a new yorker i will not only go on his show in studio and debate him i oh, will also take him out to dinner <laughs> hang out with him, become his best friend, maybe even wear matching shirts and all of that. So I am available. I'm not afraid of Sam Cedar. So, you know, deliver the message. Love it. But now Emma said he would love to do that. But let's be honest. Let's be real. Let's be straightforward. He absolutely would not love to do that. That's why I have not gotten a response, despite the fact that call outs and all the video clips and all that have been retweeted hundreds, if not thousands of times by the time I'm recording this video. And they will be retweeted repeatedly again. 
after, again, I have put it out there in this video and link to those tweets and all of that. So yeah, Sam, any day, any day you want to be humbled live on air, any day you want that to happen, I'm available. Also, again, my offer to take you out to dinner and become your best friend to throw my arm around you also stands because I'm a kind guy. I'm courteous like that. Now, look, there were a lot of petty back and forth points between Emma and Tim, and I'm going to recommend you watch the entire thing so that you can enjoy it because Tim got angry and deservedly so at points. And one of the things I noticed about Emma was that after Tim would get angry, she would shift to a real calm voice because she was more interested in generating clips rather than actually having a conversation. Well, how do you not know my, my position on abortion? I mean, you watch the show, you watch at any point, you can see the arguments we have. I don't he have a ton too. of time to watch all You specifically show. covered his episode with the serfs where they talked about it in depth. So it's weird that you don't. Well, know. reiterate your abortion position for me and I'll Our respond to it. And one of the reasons why you know that is 100% true is that Emma at one point in time, and I called her out on this, said that she didn't know Tim Pool's abortion position. Now, Emma and the majority port actually covered Tim Pool's conversation with the serfs where this was a topic. Now, the reason why Emma's saying that she didn't know her abortion position is is the same reason that the serfs was saying, oh, well, you're pro-choice, but only from a Tim Pool's perspective because they have tried to paint Tim Pool as an evil right-winger and all that, and acknowledging the basic fact that Tim Pool is pro-choice, and by the way, pro-choice up to the point that the majority of Americans who are pro-choice are up to would be a defiance of their idea that Tim Pool is this evil white racist, evil Nazi, and all that nonsense. So I noticed that in a real time and of course Emma had no answer for that other than the fact of what I just said which was she was being disingenuous because again that's who she is very nice before the show started very willing to talk about the topic of crime or anything free flowing and all of that but then pops out her laptop has her series of talking points because she intended to generate clips from her audience now the next thing that Emma did which was a huge mistake on her part was bring up this guy who was the neo-nazi hispanic uh shooter that I believe was in Texas somebody correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. I don't like to get information like this wrong. And she said that he posted clips of Tim Pool's show and all of that, which was just not the case. What was actually posted were these screenshots. And if you'll notice, there were specific time codes from a same episode of Timcast IRL. And this guy wasn't even subscribed to Tim's channel, but he was obviously watching, likely to hear the guests that were on that particular show. And if you'll notice, even though this is four screenshots, it's actually really two time codes because there's two quick screenshots in success session and they're not really that far apart they're like seconds apart so if you actually go to these clips which i said on the show and run them down what you'll find out is that tim isn't even talking and what's even crazier is that in one of them elijah schaefer's talking who i've met and i've talked to before and all that done his shows before and elijah was probably the most sensible I've ever heard him in the history of the whole time that I've known this man. He said we shouldn't be focusing so much on race because it's divisive and it would lead to violence. So he screenshotted a thing from one episode of Tim Pool's show that Elijah was actually saying something about not overemphasizing race because that could lead to problems and he doesn't want violence. And somehow that means that neo-Nazis watch Tim Pool's show. How about the fact that you called the... Uh... The grooming event. shooter in neo the neo-nazi texas shooter who watched your program you called that a false flag because you don't even know anything mm. about that story i do it was four <laughs> four clips of the episode and you can see in the images he wasn't even subscribed to the channel yeah he but he watched your show no no, 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 no. he didn't he watched I, one guy yeah have you ever went to those time codes he would he was highlighting specific uh and i won't name the guests from the guests but like, he I've did watch that. your show like this is so like you're saying he watched an episode smear. sure but do you understand okay, come why on. and he posted about that one that who was why? that one guy who watched majority report and then commented on what sam did why do you think that that, but he, no, this was a neo-Nazi. Why do you think your content appeals to neo-Nazis? Are you kidding me right now? No, I'm just wondering why you think that. Did you go to the time codes that were in that episode? Because I did, I ran this down. And one of them was a clip of Elijah Schaefer. And like weirdly for this like neo-Nazi uh, Hispanic shooter, he, like it's Elijah saying that we shouldn't be emphasizing race tattoo. specifically. No, no, he's a neo-Nazi Hispanic shooter. Right, but Tim called it a false flag and then corrected himself the next day and then said he thought it was funny after a mass shooting. I think that I mean, someone people told him... you to say this and you, you don't actually know what you're talking about. I think that it's not shocking that you think that based on my gender. Okay, you're not saying anything anymore. But like I screen grab when I because I do YouTube clips, so I will screen grab a time code so I know where to go later. So like when I saw that, I knew or I had a feeling because obviously he's dead. So or was he captured or was he killed? I think he was killed. Yeah, so he's dead. So he can't tell us. But 
like I think people screenshot because this is why I do it and you can find them in my phone moments in things so that they can go back and reference that clip. And I ran down both of those time this codes. Is, this, Neither look, one. I get it. But look, man, this is the majority report. This yeah, but why, it is why it, it is a nasty smear. Like you're doing it on purpose. And it's, it's not a political statement. It's, it's not a, a political it's a argument. Fact. You're like, he watched an episode of her show. I'm, I'm sorry, of his show. That is the nasty, vicious smear that Emma Vigeland ended up going with on the episode of Culture War that she just had locked and loaded and ready to go. But here's the thing. I've actually run this down before prior to that episode because I remember when this was being posted and I actually screenshot in this very same way in order to find time codes and clips that I'm interested in because I'm on YouTube and I like to go back. So immediately my first instinct was to run this down when this was a story a long time ago. So I actually knew the context for this so I explained it which on its own proved that Emma Vigeland had absolutely no point. But even better than that, I actually knew that Emma Vigeland worked for the Young Turks. In fact, in her Twitter bio, it still says Young Turks alum. And if we're going to talk about inspiring acts of terror, I'm going to bring up Gavin Long. And even though it took me about eight tries with Tim cutting me off to bring it up, I brought it up. And guess what? She had no answer for it. It used to be at TYT and Gavin Long, who was the Baton Rouge shooter, watched, reposted and did reactions to Young Turks videos. A lot of them were straight misinformation. There was one in particular where they were going after a cop who slammed a woman, which by the way, a cop acted inappropriately, but they wildly speculated that it was a black woman. It turned out to be a white woman. And there was a call in the video of like, what, what do you do if you see a pregnant black woman being assaulted by a cop? Gavin Long said he's going to step up. You can watch these videos. They're available online. And he shot oh, four yeah, cops. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't. That wasn't my comment. What, I didn't what say. About, oh, no, no, hold on. I didn't what, say it was your commentary. But you're saying screenshots on this guy's phone. Big problem. I got to bring it up right here. But have you ever covered at all what inspired Gavin Long? Uh, cause he I, killed four I, police officers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't. I, that wasn't my coverage. I've gone over this before. I will link in the description of this video a detailed analysis from friend of the channel. Atheism is unstoppable on this specific topic, where you will see clips of the Young Turks saying stuff about how cops are anti-black, how they're going after black people. And by the way, in some of these clips, they're talking about an incident where a white woman was assaulted by a police officer and it was erroneously stated on the Young Turks that it was a black woman before they knew the identity, which again was something that Gavin Long found particularly offensive because not only was he posting videos like this from the Young Turks on his own YouTube channel, but he was actually reacting to videos like this on his channel. In fact, there was a specific instance where somebody said something to the effect of, what do you do if a pregnant black woman is being insulted in front of you? And Ben Mankiewicz, who is actually the really reasonable person and deserves none of the smoke related to this, said, I would record on my phone, I would call for help, I would try to document it. And then he's being pressed about when do you take action? When do you fight back against the cops? Smash cut to Gavin Long, again, in his own videos that he's edited all this linked in the description if you want to check it out saying i will defend that woman i'm a real one i'm going to fight back and of course he ends up committing the baton rouge police shooting so direct one-to-one -one inspiration from the young turks where emma viglin used to work no commentary a clip a screenshot on a Facebook page or a Russian equivalent of a Facebook page, wherever they found this, of one episode of Tim Cast IRL. Oh, I'm sorry, right. I really didn't mean to trigger you. I'm sorry. No, I'm just, but I'm just curious where your standards are. Like, have you gone Look after the host on the Young clip, Turks for clip that harvesting, one? Clip harvesting, clip farming. Is that what you're doing? I don't know what you mean. It, like, okay, your demeanor changes before the show to to uh, all of a sudden now you're going. Uh, what do you mean? I'm so sorry, I triggered you. Oh, jeez. Well, I mean, I get it. You I, guys I'm are just, gonna make clips. I'm you guys to are do... lowbrow grifter drama garbage. I'm trying to. You want to talk about the merits of policy, tone, so maybe that it calms you down a little bit. You want to talk about policy, or do you want to just insult people? I I would love to talk about policy. So so uh, continue, Sean. Yeah. So the if 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 screenshots, which are of clips that weren't even him speaking, is Tim Pool inspiring the shooter? then how come you've like never done this commentary at a place you used to work at of direct inspiration? Like he saw a clip, cuts to himself saying, I'm going to step up because I'm the real one. I've like, never heard of this. So. Oh, well, that's interesting not? that you never heard of well, that. Well, so so it happened. Why do you think it? Why do you think it is that your former program appealed to mass shooters so much? Nice try, Emma. Your lack of preparation is absolutely embarrassing, and I'm glad I was there on such a large audience in order to bring up the issue of Gavin Long, which, by the way, 
his direct inspiration by the Young Turks was never addressed, acknowledged, nor did they apologize for that on the channel. In fact, they reported it as a sovereign citizen attack, so they ended up blaming the right wing, which is funny because Emma said, oh, well, the reason why I care is because most of the terrorism is right wing terrorism, so right wing bad. I cover right wingers and I know that right wing terrorism in this country dwarfs any kind of left wing terrorism by like a nine to one figure. What does that do I might be underestimating ask? because I cover right the real threat in this country, which is right wing terrorism. Sure. So I'll ask again, I guess, like, why do you think it is this mass shooter was inspired by your former program? I would have to look into it to, to make a smart. Do you feel bad that it. he was inspired directly and admitted he was? I sure. I mean, I, I, I again, I, it's not. Do you take responsibility? It wasn't even my program. I, I worked there. But yeah. So you were, you, were, you were providing material support. Wow. You see, I, I don't you know see, if she you, was you, there at the time, no, to look, be fair to you. I like, don't think I was. But I will say, um, it is interesting because the Young Turks did cover this shooting. And even though, again, reacted specifically to Young Turks videos covering the cops very poorly, propaganda inspired him to commit this violence, in my opinion. If you want to talk about the Young Turks, you should talk to them. I, 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 would, yeah. I would love to at some point in my life. But so he does this, but the Young Turks coverage of it called him just a sovereign citizen. So this yeah. would be categorized as that right wing terrorism, this even is, though this, he was this is the thing, right? inspired by a left wing news organization, Let's, specifically left wing. I'll figures. do it. I'll do a semi segue. Again, Emma, you were talking about Tim Pool directly inspiring somebody that he did not directly inspire. And then the counter example was a direct inspiration from the Young Turks by somebody who was inspired by them. And you used to work there and you're still friends with them. So what's going on, Emma? Why, why won't you address it? Why won't you be able to have the same scrutiny for your own side that you would have for Tim Pool. Why don't you hold it up to the same exact standards? I mean, again, according to this logic, if anybody who ever committed a crime at any point ever, ever watched her show or any episode of the Young Turks or Majority Report or whatever, then the person who put out that content would, of course, be responsible for that violence. Now, look, in closing, yes, I definitely wish I would have been able to talk more on this program. I wish we would have stayed on the topic of crime and that Tim didn't chase Emma down a bunch of these different rabbits. Holes. That being said, she came for personal attacks. She came to personally insult Tim Pool to try to make herself look good and then pretend like she wasn't doing what we could all see that she was doing. So in that situation where she's trying to attack him personally, say he inspires violence and all of that nonsense, it's not my role in that moment to just jump in and not let Tim defend himself. And at certain points in time, I was trying to moderate the conversation in order to move on to a topic that I was more interested interested in because I felt like they were getting bogged down on Burisma and other topics that I didn't find all that interesting. But overall, I'm not sorry that I let Tim defend himself and jumped in on points where I knew for a fact that Emma was totally out of line, had no basis for her attacks, and all that. I mean, look at the desistance conversation where I specifically distinguished the fact that Emma kept saying detransition while Tim was talking about desistance. I thought that was important to be there because that was the entire thing where they were arguing in circles with the surfs debate. So as somebody who saw that then and didn't get the chance to call it out in real time because I was not there, I decided to call it out in real time because because I could see the back and forth. If if it is true that prescribing puberty blockers prevents people from hitting that point of puberty where they would decide and largely they would decide to desist, right, when they hit the point of puberty, would you be in favor of removing that from the gender protocol? Because this only is talking about desistance at the point of puberty. So, like, what he's concerned about is that if you stop people from going through puberty, you stop the changes in their bodies and all that, and then they can't, like, rationally make that choice because they haven't hit that point in their development. I, I, I don't have the uh, kind of, I guess, arrogance, I would say. To I mean, know I asked you, I I ask you a hypothetical, about, like, hypothetically. Right, but I, again, this is exactly what reactionary conservatives do. You know, it's a red flag from you deal, make arguments. If you deal, not, if you deal with hypotheticals, because th when you actually deal with the practical reality and the outcomes that you're dealing with and that you're uh, prescribing onto society it creates an inherently unjust society so let me you know just, as, let the, me just, as if, the right-wing conservative destiny said recently when he was debating the left-wing pro-lifers it is a definite red flag when somebody is unwilling completely to engage with the hypothetical if you want to say why the hypothetical doesn't apply that is totally fine no because i want to talk just about like reality. say oh it's a hypothetical i can't okay. talk about it I as if you don't so. know what a thought because... experiment is it's kind of odd now with that being said i was actually sent a bunch of different snippets and clips and whatnot that made people laugh and i just have to say one of my favorite ones which i haven't been seeing circulating was this quick one where emma brings up a study that followed transes for about five years and me 
me sarcastically mocking her for that, her realizing it, and her facial expression, which Surge, by the way, excellent switchboarding to get the timing of this down pack. The American Journal of Pediatrics did a study about transitioning children. They studied them over five years. 94% of the children continued mm -hmm. to identify as the gender that they were choosing to identify when with placed at the on beginning. Five whole then, years? Yeah, wow. yes. Wow. And when placed on loop. Even though this clip is incredibly short, even though this is not the most substantive portion of the conversation, I have to say, I found this to be incredibly funny because there is a moment where you can actually see on her face where she realizes that I was not asking a question. I was actually making fun of her. And you could see the frustration, that micro expression that she could not hide. And I love being able to get under the people's skin that I argue with in ways like this. And for me and for my friends who actually saw this club, this was one of their favorites. There are other ones that are absolutely hilarious, like the one that was circulating thanks to Adam Friended. Also appreciated that one. So you are kind of... To the right of Donald Trump on this, who has been releasing nonviolent offenders. Per, or yeah, oh no, Donald president. Trump's first step act is absolutely terrible. It sets up a bunch of incentives. Well, the, I mean, that, you're that further right than I'd imagine a ton of this audience is. I mean, that, that's, that's fine. That's, that's like, I'm not here that's to, extremist. I'm not here to win over the audience. Well, I will win over the audience because I'm correct. Overall, while I wish I would have been able to stay on the topic that I wanted to talk about for longer and trap Emma in multiple different ways in her horrible positions, I'm happy with the way that things went also afterwards tim super nice to me sushi poker we end up hanging out i did a show with seamus invited me on irl and even invited me out to the casino at which point i was too tired and i ended up going to bed because that was a wrap for me way past my bedtime i'm an old man but i appreciate tim for doing that and i appreciate everybody at the compound honestly all 8.5 million of you guys, absolutely great people. From the driver, from the people on Cast Castle, which is their comedy show. Always a pleasure to see Chris Poole. Always a pleasure to see Ian. All of the people that were there treated me with such kindness and whatnot. And I am awaiting a response from Sammy Boy, Sam Cedar, the seed man himself, for not only our debate, but also for our date. I'm dead serious, buddy. I will take you out to dinner. You know what? I'm ending it right now. I will make you dinner if that is the preference. I will bring over food and we'll have a good time and you'll lose each and every point on criminal justice because again, Sammy boy, nobody's afraid of you. Anyway, that's all I really have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, show them by leaving a like. Subscribe for more content. Follow me on all my social medias. They will be linked in the description of this video. Thank you so much for all of you who supported both my appearances on IRL and on this. Till next time.